Welcome back to the second video for engine lubrication systems. In this video, we're gonna talk about the components involved in the lubrication system, their job, and how they sort of work. So our lubrication system consists of our oil pan, our oil pump pickup, our oil pump, the oil filter, we'll talk about how to pick the correct oil filter and all that, that fun stuff, oil passages, also known as oil galleys, various valves found inside of our system, and some of the gauges and warning lights. And in fact, actually, that's probably where I'll start. So our engine warning lights, or I'm sorry, our engine oil warning lights are going to be sort of as follows. So your two lights that you need to be concerned with that apply to your lubrication system are your maintenance required light and the little oil can light on your dash. One is orange, the other is red, and those colors mean something. Orange or yellow usually means slow down, right? Red means stop, something's wrong. And that's exactly what these lights are going to apply to as well. Your maintenance required usually tells you that, uh, that, that you're due for an oil change. Hey, here's a friendly warning. Time to think about doing your oil change or it's time to start doing your oil change. A lot of manufacturers um, will have a maintenance required light and a, a lot of modern vehicles have been putting a, a sort of gauge for your oil life, almost like in Mortal Kombat, right? When you're fighting, you got a like life bar and the more you get hit, the more that life bar dwindles down, your oil life starts at 100%, right? Now, when your engine oil starts to say 80%, 50%, it doesn't mean that that's capacity. It doesn't mean that it's at 50% capacity. Um, you still have the same amount of engine oil that you started with, besides some of the stuff that you burned off. But what it means is the oil life. It's, it's that life bar, like that Mortal Kombat life bar, right? So when you're at 50% oil life, it's worn down 50%. Most manufacturers will recommend that you change your oil when you hit 20%. I recommend that as well. If you change your oil at around 20 to 10% every single time around, your engine oil is going to, uh, I'm sorry, your engine is going to thank you and you will have less problems. That engine will wear out um, a, a lot less and will last you a lot longer without giving you certain problems if you do those oil changes. It doesn't seem like a lot um, because let's say, okay, you go to, man, I remember working at the dealership, customers would come in at negative 20%. So they let it get all the way down to zero and then it went past to negative 20%. Okay, you do your oil change, you got fresh oil, you're good to go, no, nothing bad happened. Here's the problem, you do that over and over and over and over again, that engine will wear out faster. And so you're gonna start to run into engine oil consumption problems, you're gonna start to run into compression problems earlier on. So it's really important, those little things over a period of time, doing your oil changes on time, they, they will really help you out in the end and you can make an engine last so much longer by just doing your maintenance at the required time. So that's what your maintenance required is. Not all um, manufacturers will put a percentage. So maybe you just have the maintenance required light on. Don't drive another 10,000 miles with that maintenance required light on. That maintenance required light means, hey, you should change your engine oil as soon as you can. Um, so try to, to do it at at uh, when it's recommended. I also don't recommend always relying on the maintenance required light. You should be keeping a track, uh, maybe journaling of some sort. A lot of vehicle manufacturers will put it in the owner's manual where you can sort of catalog when and what mileage you're doing your oil changes at. That way you can keep track. Um, if you're not the one doing your oil changes, a lot of times they'll give you a little sticker in the window that tells you what mileage they did the oil change at and whatnot. Um, so try to get that if you can. But that's your maintenance required light. The red oil can is different. That red oil can is letting you know that your oil pressure is dangerously low. So your oil pressure should be at around 10 PSI for every 1000 RPM. So if I'm at 3000 RPM, I should have 30 PSI of oil pressure. Most engines will run on average from 40 to 60 PSI regularly, whether you're at idle or higher RPM. 
um, but because your oil pumps are going to be running at engine speed, the higher RPM, the more they're turning, the higher the oil pressure you're gonna get. Um, so why would you have dangerously low oil pressure? A common reason for some people is that you don't have enough oil in there. Um, so if you don't have enough oil in there, you're not gonna have any pressure. Uh, if you see that red oil light, you need to stop the engine as soon as you safely can, pull over, and check your oil level on your dipstick. So turn the engine off, get a rag, pop the hood. Um, you're going to go ahead and pull the dipstick out, wipe it clean before you even try to read it, and then go ahead, put it all the way back in, and that second time around, check your engine oil. It should still be on the dipstick. If you are at low, the low mark, either the bottom dot or where it says L or the bottom of the hash, then you're a quart low. That's not that big of a deal. You, that's no reason for you to be having a red oil light on. Um, so if there's any oil on the dipstick at all, that's not the cause of your red oil light. If there's nothing on the dipstick, that could be the cause of your red oil light. Go in a gas station and get some engine oil. At this point in time, you're like, oh my gosh, I don't remember if I use synthetic or non-synthetic. Which one do I get? At this point, really doesn't matter. Um, get some engine oil in there. Doesn't matter, conventional or synthetic. Get some oil in there because it's going to be better than nothing. And then you can worry about it when you go to do your oil change. Um, because obviously you need an oil change. So that's one reason you could have a red oil light. Another reason you could have a red oil light is because uh, my, my lubrication system is not functioning properly. So either my oil pump, my oil pump pickup, something is wrong to where my oil system cannot build up pressure. Uh, this can also happen due to sort of a, a blown engine when you spin a bearing, but that'll usually be accompanied by a, a pretty gnarly knock in the engine along with that red oil light. So if you get the red oil light and you're hearing some, some knocking going on inside the engine, you might be in trouble um, and, and that engine's probably toast. Um, but those are some other reasons why you might get a red oil can light. But Let's say it's just because you had very little oil in there. That could easily be fixed by simply checking um, and putting oil in there. If you never check and you just drive and drive and drive with this light on, that problem went from just being low on engine oil to now you have a blown engine. So you could have fixed that problem with a $30 oil change. But if you keep running it with that problem, now you've got a problem where that's going to cost you, I don't know, two, three, four thousand dollars $4,000. So keeping an eye on things and just being aware of what's going on in your, your engine and what's going on with your lubrication system can save you so much money. Even a problem as much as a, a pickup tube, which I'll talk about here in a minute, um, can still be a lot less of a problem. Don't drive around with that red oil light. I say this a lot because I had students that have blown engines because they're like, oh, I, I, I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to drive with that light on. Any red light that stays on, you need to fix that problem first before you continue driving. So those are your warning lights. Uh, your oil pan itself is a pretty simple component. Its job is to sit on the bottom of your engine and it's a storage device for all the oil in the system. Um, and that's really its basic job. However, there are a couple added components that we might put in there that um, can help out. So first and foremost, there's almost always going to be a drain bolt at the bottom of your oil pan so you can do an oil change. So when I go to do an oil change, I'm going to pull that drain bolt out and I'm going to allow all that old oil to, to drain out and I can plug that oil plug back in or drain pull black, bleh, back in. Um, and, and pretty much all oil pans are going to have some sort of drain bolt. With that being said, there's a couple components that may or may not be found in the oil pan. So your oil pan may have a baffle uh, or a windage tray in there. What the heck are those? So a baffle is going to go at the bottom of the pan that's going to keep oil from sloshing back and forth. Um, what we have inside of our oil pan is going to be what is pretty much like a straw. It's actually our pickup tube, which is the next slide. 
and that straw is going to suck up from the bottom of the oil pan uh, to, to your pump, right? So kind of like if you're, you're drinking a drink uh, through a straw, right? Whatever your, wherever your straw is at the bottom of the cup, that's what you're, you're sucking up, right? Well, that straw is going to suck from the bottom of the pan. And when you go to take off, especially on heavy acceleration or heavy braking, we don't want the oil to slosh all the way to the front or to the back of the pan because now that straw can't pick up anything, right? So what we did is we sort of put these, these plates or walls in place to keep the oil from sloshing around. We call those baffles. So baffles can be found in the plates or, or can be found in the bottom of the pan to keep that sloshing from happening, to keep oil in the bottom of the pan so our straw can pick it up. A windage tray is something a little bit different. Um, the windage tray might be a company with something uh, special and they're called a crank scraper, but we won't get too into that. A windage tray, which I don't have a picture of here, is going to be located a little bit either higher up in the pan or that windage tray might be located bolted directly underneath your crankshaft above the pan. A windage tray is to help keep um, the windage. Uh, let me explain this a little better. So your crankshaft is spinning super fast, right? Those bicycle pedals are spinning crazy fast inside the engine at the bottom, right? Well, that's going to create a windage or it's going to create this turbulence in the air. What we don't want that turbulence to do is to froth up or whip up your engine oil, right? Now, there's going to be uh, anti-foaming additives that are to help keep this from happening in your engine oil, but some engines are going to create more windage than others. And so we might put a little windage tray in there to help protect the engine oil down here from all that turbulent air from your crankshaft right up above it. Um, also, we don't want engine oil splashing up and the crank hitting that engine oil because it doesn't seem like much, but as my crankshaft is spinning super duper fast, if there's any splashing of engine oil and that engine oil splashes up and the crankshaft smacks that, 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 those droplets of engine oil, we can create other problems. Um, we, can, we can lose power because of that. We can actually create engine damage if we're talking a larger amount of engine oil that sort of came up and the engine oil slapped it. Um, you can kind of think of jumping out of a plane into the ocean. Um, we're talking a lot of, of speed or velocity that's happening and um, liquid is not very nice to that. So uh, to prevent damage from happening, we will also keep uh, have a windage tray and or crank scraper um, which isn't what it sounds like. It's not actually touching the crank. It's simply capturing all the droplets of oil that's coming from the crank and keeping them so we don't have any droplets that are splashing up around the crank. Um, again, because we don't want jumping out of an airplane into an ocean, belly flopping. So those are just some of the components on there. One last one is that some vehicle manufacturers might have an oil level sensor um, Chevy uses this, a lot of manufacturers do, not all though, will have an oil level sensor inside the oil pan. So once the engine oil drops, let's say usually by a quart, um, that oil level sensor won't see any engine oil and it will let you know on the dashboard. Um, like I said, Chevy uses this and they'll have a little warning on there telling you with a yellow light, not a red light, saying to check your engine oil level. It usually means you're about a quart low. That's when that light will come on. Um, and in that, you should check your engine oil. If you are in fact a quart low, you should add a quart, uh, especially if you're not almost due for an oil change. So that's your oil pan in a nutshell. Now, if you've ever heard of wet sump systems versus dry sump or dry sump systems, um, what that really means is most engines are gonna come stock with a wet sump system, meaning I've got an oil pan at the bottom that is my storage device for my oil and that's where I pick up my oil from. A dry sump system doesn't really have an oil pan. It does, but it's flat because we're not storing oil down here. That wet sump system has an external pump, we call it a scavenge pump, 
and that uh, it's actually gonna have two pumps. So we've got a pressure pump and we've got a scavenge pump. The scavenge pump is going to suck engine oil out from the bottom of the pan and it's gonna put it in a storage device that is remote. So you can put that in the back of the car, you can put it somewhere else in the engine bay, um, but it's going to help prevent that sloshing that we talked about. Um, also, that scavenge pump is going to create a vacuum down in the bottom of where your pan is, which is going to give you uh, a couple of benefits. It's actually going to help with some pumping losses, um, and, and that's a little bit of an advanced topic for this class, but it's going to actually help you make a little bit more power with a dry sump system because that scavenge pump is pulling a vacuum in the crankcase. Um, it's also going to keep from having leaks and stuff happen inside of there. Uh, then the oil is going to go through some sort of oil cooler in a dry sump system. And like I said, go back to your storage container, which is remotely located. And then from there, we're going to have a pressure pump. And that pressure pump is going to pump oil pressure into all the uh, engine components that are, need to be located or, or, or that need, need to be lubricated. The wet sump system has a pump that it's going to suck oil. It just has the one pump. It's, it's a pressure pump. Um, and it's gonna suck oil from the bottom of the pan and it's gonna pressurize it going through a filter and pressurizing uh, oil through the rest of the system that needs to get lubricated. So all your pistons, valves, crank, all that stuff. And then it's gonna drip back down to the bottom of the pan and do this all over again. So um, the other benefit is a lot better cooling capabilities with your dry sump system. So um, I can get more into this in a tune-up and electrical class or an engine performance one class or even an engine rebuild class, um, but that's as far as I'll get in this one. Uh, just so you sort of have a, a, a vague over, uh, understanding of the wet sump versus dry sump systems. Now, I was talking about a straw coming from the bottom of your oil pan. That is your oil pump pickup. So if we, if we pull the oil pan off, we're gonna see something that looks a little bit like this, where this is our crankshaft being held in by our main caps, and then I've got my oil pump pickup uh, on the bottom. So if we look at an oil pump pickup, it looks kinda like this. This is where it's gonna hook up to our oil pump, right? And our oil pump is gonna be what sucks engine oil. Right here is where it bolts on to either one of the mains or, or on the bottom of the block. And you can see if we look closely in there, that oil pump pickup is going to suck through this hole. And that hole has a little screen. This provides as sort of a preliminary oil filter, if you will, um, to pretty much keep any large debris from getting into our oil pump and damaging the pump. So the oil pump pickup is going to sit at the bottom of the pan close to the bottom of the pan. We don't want it sitting at the top, right? Because it can't suck up anything down at the bottom here. And so this would be considered empty, right? So we'd have all this oil we can't use. So the, the pickup has to sit at the bottom of the pan. My pump's gonna sit up here and it's gonna suck and suck and suck oil from the bottom of my pan, just like a straw. Now, just like a straw, if the straw is cracked or broken, let's say I get a crack or a break somewhere in my oil pump pickup here, I am not going to be able to suck oil very well, right? So imagine drinking a soda out of a cup and you have a crack in that straw. You're going to suck up a bunch of air pockets with the, the soda or whatever you're drinking, right? That's exactly what happens to your engine. So if I've got a bad oil pump pickup that cracked or broke somehow, some way, my engine is not gonna get lubricated very well because it's gonna suck up a bunch of air along with some engine oil and it's just gonna be aerated engine oil. That's why you wanna pay attention to your lights. That can cause a red oil light. And this is not a very expensive component and a lot of times it's not even very hard to replace. So if this is the only problem and you saw that red oil light, you turned off the engine, had this fixed, had an oil change and we're back up and running, you're good to go and, and saved yourself thousands of dollars potentially rather than if you just ran with that red oil light and you, you ran with a bad cracked pickup and now you just blew your engine. So 
small components can add to large problems if you don't pay attention to them. So the oil pump pickup can also get clogged. So as I showed you that screen, if it picks up a big chunk of sludge and it, it plugs that screen, now it's like, uh, have you ever had a smoothie from Juice It Up? And you're drinking your smoothie, but they didn't blend it well enough. And so there's like a strawberry chunk or something like that at the bottom and it plugs the straw and now you can't suck up anything. That's exactly what will happen with your oil pump pickup. And again, you will lose oil pressure. So keep an eye on that red light. If that red light comes on, you need to have that change. Again, that could be a very simple fix. Uh, so that's just sort of something to keep in mind. Um, it can get clogged, it can get cracked, and this is not common common, but I've seen it um, multiple occasions where the oil pump pickup was the problem and the cause of a red oil light. So that's what our oil pump pickup does. The oil pump itself is going to be just that. It's a pump that is going to displace oil from one place, the bottom of your pan, and pump it through the rest of the engine. Now an oil pump is going to be that of a positive displacement type pump. What does that mean? Positive displacement means, and if we watch the volume on this side of our pump um, coming out the other side, you guys see how that volume increases, 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 and then we're going to squeeze it down and decrease it. That is the same amount of volume, right? every single time we rotate this rotor here. That is a positive displacement type pump. It means that it pumps the same volume every rotation. Same exact volume every rotation. So if I have a higher amount of rotations, I'm gonna pump more volume, right? So a positive displacement type pump doesn't pump pressure. It pumps volume. That volume will eventually build a pressure because of restrictions inside of our oil system. So this pump can go bad and you can lose oil pressure because of it, but it's not near as common as say a cracked pickup um, or simply a worn out engine with large clearances. Um, I've rarely seen oil pumps go bad, mainly because of their design as pretty sturdy. Um, they do go bad from time to time, but uh, not, not near as often. Like I said, I've seen a lot more cracked and damaged pickups uh, than, than bad oil pumps. Now, there's actually more than two types of pumps, but I'm only gonna talk about two here um, because this is a basic class. We've got gear type pumps and we've got rotor type pumps. There's actually vein type pumps as well. Um, and your oil pump is generally gonna be driven either by the camshaft or the crankshaft but it's going to be directly correlated with the engine RPM. So every rotation of the engine, you're going to get rotations of your, your oil pump as well. So it, if it's driven off of the crank, a lot of times it'll be right on the crank pulley or right behind the crank pulley itself. Um, if it's driven by the camshaft, it's probably going to be somewhere near the oil pan below, but it's gonna have a little shaft that comes up and it gets spun off of your camshaft. It really depends on the manufacturer. So your gear type pumps are gonna look like this a lot of the time or like that, um, where what we're doing is every time we rotate those gears, they're going to mesh and unmesh, and the volume is gonna get displaced from one side to the other. So every rotation of those gears is going to pump out a certain amount of engine oil. The volume that it pumps is going to be dependent on the size and length of the teeth on those gears. Um, your rotor type pumps are going to work very similar. Um, and in fact, here we've got one right here, right? So I'm going to have some sort of inlet, some sort of outlet, and every time we rotate our pump, we are going to suck in oil and we're gonna squeeze it back out. Suck in oil and squeeze it back out. That's how our gear type pumps work too. It's just a different design, that's all. Um, you can see the picture here. I've got a rotor type pump that is right off of our crankshaft. Here's our oil pump pickup tube. So you can see every rotation of that pump is going to suck up oil from our straw and it's going to squeeze it back out into the system to push it through our crankshaft, our, our main journals, our raw journals, all of our valve train, everything else that needs to get lubricated. 
Again, the size of the rotor is going to determine your oil pressure. Now, because our oil pumps are positive displacement type pumps, they pump the same volume every single time, I'm gonna need to regulate that because higher RPMs, I'm gonna pump way too much pressure. And there is such a thing as too much pressure being pumped. Um, if I pump too much pressure in my lubrication system, now we're gonna have a problem where I might start leaking oil out of gaskets and things like that. So we don't want too much oil pressure. So what we did is we put a little valve inside of our system called the pressure regulating valve. Now the job of the pressure regulating valve is going to open up every time we build up too much pressure. So it'll be a set pressure. So let's say they put the uh, pressure regulating valve at 65 PSI. That means if uh, my, my system has 65 PSI in it, as soon as it hits 65 PSI, uh, this is a small picture, but you can probably see if you open up your canvas um, presentation here, I don't know why this picture shows the oil filter being so gigantic compared to everything, but uh, here's our straw, here's our pump. Um, looks like maybe a, a gear type pump where we've, we've got two gears meshing. And through our straw, we're sucking up through our pump and we're pre pressurizing our whole system. Um, we've got a check ball that's sitting on a preset uh, a spring. And let's say that spring is set to 65 PSI or pounds. So every time I exceed 65 PSI in the system, it's going to press that spring back and offload any engine oil pressure that is excessive back into the pan. So we can't exceed 65 PSI in our system to again prevent leaks and, and other problems by over pressurizing the system. This pressure regulating valve is going to control maximum pressure, not minimum pressure. It's only to create uh, or, or to not allow too much pressure. It's not going to regulate if it doesn't have enough pressure, if that makes sense. Um, so this is only for overpressurizing. Now the oil filters themselves, um, obviously any filter is meant to clean, right? Your air filter is meant to clean the air coming into the engine. Your oil filter is meant to clean the engine oil in your system. They're designed to capture particles smaller than you can really see. Um, now, here is a couple of things that I feel like are really important. First and foremost, you need to change your oil filter every oil change. I know some manufacturers say you only have to change it every other oil change. Um, here's why I don't always trust manufacturers sometimes when it comes to maintenance. A lot of times they will push maintenance intervals to more than might be recommended because in the long run, a lot of people will look at, okay, if I'm going to buy this car, what's the cost of ownership? What's the cost to maintain this vehicle? And if that number is too high, the person may not buy that car. So to make the cars more sellable, if you will, they may try to push some of those, those maintenance intervals for certain things because they want that car to seem cheaper to maintain. But in the long run, it's just like taking a shower and getting out and putting your dirty underwear back on. If that oil filter is dirty, it's not gonna filter very well um, and eventually it's gonna get clogged and create other problems. So every oil change is how often you should change that oil filter. I don't care what your vehicle manufacturer says there. Um, I, I would not do it every uh, other oil change uh, for that very reason. Now, are all oil filters created equal? Who makes the best filter? They are not created equal. And price a lot of times does have a part to play in it, but just because it's the most expensive filter on the shelf doesn't mean it's the best filter on the shelf. So here's what I mean by that. Um, a lot of us are familiar with Fram oil filters. Um, they're not a bad filter. The problem is, is they're usually a C. If, I was a, if it was a student, I would give them a C. Um, their filtering media is all right. They're usually held together with cardboard of some sort. Um, and they'll, they'll do the bare minimum. So when you're looking at an oil filter, the quality of the oil filter is determined by two things. 
Does it have an anti-drain back diaphragm? Does it have a bypass valve, which I'll talk about in the next two slides here? The quality of the filter inside, meaning how tight is that filtering media and what is it held together with? Um, because obviously cardboard is, is not great. Like I said, as long as you're changing your oil filters every oil change, it shouldn't be that big of a deal. Um, however, it's not going to filter as good as something I would give an A, right? So what would be an A? This is going to be a, a manufacturer filter. This is a Toyota filter. And a lot of your manufacturer filters are going to have much tighter um, filtering media. So if you were to look at the, the filter material, it's better. This is held together with metal rather than uh, cardboard. And so we're talking top tier oil filter. So after cutting apart a lot of oil filters, here's what I've found. Mobile is very much like a factory oil filter. It's, it's pretty much almost identical to the inside of what I just showed you from a Toyota factory filter. Um, another very, ex it, it is expensive though. Another very expensive filter is going to be a KNN. KNN filters are great. They look very much like, in fact, the, the filtering media on this one looks very good, held together by metal. Um, but even better, the coolest thing about KNN's filter is that they have that cool little nut on the top. So it makes it a whole lot easier to loosen these up, especially when they get really tight on there. So bless you, KNN, for putting that on there. I wish more oil filter companies would do that. Um, I'm actually wondering if they have a patent on that because nobody else does that. Um, and that's just a genius idea. So anyways, you're going to pay for that nut though. Um, you know, we're talking $15, $20 uh, oil filters as to where your Fram might be, you know, 5 to $7. However, with that being said, um, your factory oil filters, some of the best filters you can get are usually not very expensive. In fact, they cost you probably around what a Fram would cost you. Um, and some manufacturers will give you a deal. So I know at a lot of Hondas, they, uh, Honda dealers, they will, if, if you buy three filters, they'll give you the fourth one for free. Um, so if you're buying in bulk, that, that saves you some money. And in fact, it makes them even cheaper than your Fram filters and their top notch filters, what the factory puts on those cars. So not all filters are created equal. I will tell you if you're looking for a bargain filter that is going to give you a nice tight filtering media, just like a factory one is going to have an anti-drain back in and uh, a bypass valve on there is going to be, if you're shopping, say like at a Napa is going to be Wix. Um, and some vehicle manufacturers, uh, O'Reilly may carry Wix as well. Napa filters are made actually I believe by the Wix, uh, company or the Wix factory, W I X. Wix makes an excellent filter at a very, very low cost. So if you're looking for something that's a Fram price or even cheaper than Fram, but way better, Wix is, is your go-to or even a Napa filter is going to be a great go-to. But um, if you're into buying factory parts, which my OCD really likes everything to match, I usually just go to the dealer and I, I buy filters. So my, uh, my, my Chevy Tahoe usually gets, um, if, if it doesn't get a Wix, it's usually getting an AC Delco filter. My Honda, I have never put anything besides a Honda filter on there. And that's simply because they give me the deal every, th uh, buy three, get the fourth for free. So, um, and sometimes, you know, if you're cool with the parts person, they'll give you a, a they'll throw in a washer for you, um, for your drain bolt. So anyways, that they're not all created equal and they do have special components on them that are going to um that there's two valves inside your oil filter that any quality filter has so uh, i already talked about the filtering media um and and the difference between the brands but your your bypass valve in your oil filter if it's a $3 oil filter, it probably doesn't have a bypass valve. So I wouldn't trust your really, really cheap oil filters just because of that. So what is a bypass valve? Bypass valves are built into oil filters for when they get clogged. 
So um, what will happen is oil is going to travel through. Uh, if we're looking at the bottom of our oil filter, your oil is coming through these little holes here, these outside holes. Then it goes through the filtering media. So here's, here's it coming from our outside. It travels outside of our filtering media and it gets pushed in through our filtering media and comes out the center right here. And all the oil that comes out the center here is going to be clean oil that was filtered by your oil filter. Well, what happens when this filtering media gets clogged? The last thing we want is for your engine to starve of engine oil. So what we do is we will create a valve that's going to allow um, when it gets backed up, instead of just clogging and no oil coming out the center, it will allow it to bypass. And it's either going to be on the top or on the bottom here. Different filters put it in different places, but they're usually internal. Um, and it will bypass and just come in through the open or, or the inlet holes and go right back out the center. Dirty oil is better than no oil. However, you never know when the filter's in bypass operation. There's no uh, light that comes on. There's no sensor that's monitoring this. Some newer vehicles with a cartridge style filter may let you know, but for the most part, you don't know, which is why you change your engine oil uh, filter every time you do an oil change, um, because you never know when it's in bypass operation. If your oil filter doesn't have a bypass valve, you will have no oil. So um, don't cheap it out too much on your, your oil filters. Like I said, if you're really skimping on cash, Wix makes a great cheap filter that does have bypass valves. Anti-drain back valves are pretty much found on every oil filter. I've never actually found an oil filter that doesn't have an anti-drain back diaphragm. So your anti-drain back diaphragm is actually located behind this plate here. So this is the bottom of our oil filter. Uh, we have one cut off here so you can see. So again, our oil is going to come through these little holes here. It's going to come in through our filter and it's going to come back out, clean oil through the center. Well, your anti-drain back diaphragm is uh, right on top of those little holes. So I can actually take this out here. It's actually a sort of one-way flap. So oil can come in and push that flap up, right? But when you turn the engine off, what we don't want is all of the oil everywhere, including inside of your filter, to drain back down inside the pan, which most of the oil does. But that oil filter, this is a pretty big volume to fill. So every time if I go to start up my engine, I don't want to have to waste pressure pressurizing that filter first. So what we'll do is we'll put this diaphragm inside of the oil filter so when the engine gets turned off and the system's not pressurized, that flap will come back down and no oil can travel back down out of the filter. That way, when I go to start back up, this is already filled with oil and I don't have to pressurize this every single time, only when you change the filter. This is going to help your engine get lubrication right on startup and can help your engine from starving of, of oil when it's uh, starting up. So the anti-drain back diaphragm, like I said, is pretty much found on most all oil filters, but it is really important to have on there. That is the end of our lubrication system video. In the next videos, we're gonna do the cooling system and we'll talk about coolant and all that fun stuff. Um, if you guys have any questions, please, again, make sure that you post them in the comments or uh, send me a message via Canvas or, or whatnot and we can address them or bring your questions to the next Zoom session. So I will see you guys in the cooling system video.